Welcome to episode 269 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Michael Ghibli who served in the FBI for nearly 24 years. In this episode, Mike Ghibli reviews his undercover role as a firearms dealer working with Edward McLarnon, who was plotting to illegally purchase weapons to carry out a plot to murder government officials in New Hampshire and his ex-wife's husband. Boston Division Special Agent Brian LeBlanc was the case agent of this anti-government domestic terrorism investigation. Mike Ghibli was an FBI certified undercover agent for more than 20 years and worked many undercover operations across the United States and in countries around the world. The undercover assignments he worked were for a variety of violations, including domestic terrorism, international terrorism, organized crime, drugs, white-collar crime, crimes against children, national security matters, public corruption, and others. Mike was initially assigned to the Philadelphia Division and later transferred to the Boston Division and the Portsmouth, New Hampshire Resident Agency. During his bureau career, Mike was awarded the FBI Boston Division's Paul Cavanaugh Special Agent of the Year Award in 2015, several Department of Justice Awards, and the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force OSADEF Case of the Year Award. Towards the end of his career, Mike became the Supervisory Senior Resident Agent for the New Hampshire offices of the FBI. His last assignment before retiring was acting assistant special agent in charge of Boston's counterterrorism branch. Despite being a member of management, Mike continued to work undercover until the very end of his career. Now, before we get to the episode, I do want to let you know, after six and a half years of saying that I'll never have ads on this show, this will probably be the first episode where you'll hear ads. Many of you have been wondering for years why I didn't have ads on the show. And it was because many of the shows that I listened to just had too many ads. And I thought, I can't do that to you. Plus, I wasn't interested in taking the time to record some host read ad where I'm marketing some commercial product. But with dynamic ad insertion, where I tell my service provider where I want them to insert ads, and Lipson does that for me, it has become more acceptable for me. It's not going to be intrusive. You'll see an ad every 20 minutes or so. I look at it this way now. It's a good thing. I'll be able to continue to buy new equipment and hire people to help me put the show together and market it to get new listeners. I want to welcome new listeners In your podcast app's description of this episode, you'll find links to where you can buy me a coffee, sign up for my reader team email to learn more about the FBI and books, TV, and movies, and visit my website to learn more about me and my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, retired agent Michael Ghibli. Hey, Mike, how are you? Hey, Jerry. Thanks for having me. Well, I had to because I saw you talk about this case on TV on the CBS show FBI Declassified. And I thought, oh, yeah, this is one that we have to talk about because your subject, Edward McLarnon, could have just been somebody accused of domestic violence because he wanted to kill his ex-wife. But this case was a domestic terrorism case. And it's just really wild how everything worked out. You were the undercover agent, right? That's correct. Yes. All right. So I think what we should do is just let you start from the very beginning. So where do you want to start? First of all, Jerry, what I'd like to start is by thanking you. I was a brand new young agent in the Philadelphia office and met a very experienced FBI agent named Jerry Williams, who was always incredibly respected and nice to me. So for you 25 years later to reach out to me, I'm humbled and grateful because 
I never forgot the things you did for me and other new agents. So I'm extremely honored that you would think enough of me to invite me. I never forgot the things you did for us. So thank you again for having me. Wow. Thank you. I'm grinning from ear to ear that you made my day. <laughs> so that's the truth. As far as the case goes, Jerry, in, in the fall of 2015, I get a phone call from the undercover coordinator. And at the time is Mike McGowan. Mike is, without question, one of the most experienced FBI undercover agents in bureau history, another Philadelphia agent as well at one point in time. But he's the undercover coordinator at the time. I'm the assistant undercover coordinator. And he says, come down here. I got to talk to you. Get here as soon as you can. So I drive down to Boston. At the time, I was assigned to the Portsmouth, New Hampshire resident agency office. And he begins to explain to me that the domestic terrorism squad has got something Bruin sends me over to see the case agent, Brian LeBlanc. Mike doesn't tell me much, but at that point in time, I'd been a certified undercover agent for 17, 18 years. I'd worked every single day with Mike on a large group of undercover assignments. So it was just the way it went. There was not a lot of explanation, nor did I need it. It was just go talk to LeBlanc and figure it out. So I went and sat down with Brian LeBlanc, another very experienced case agent. Brian was relatively new to the Boston division at the time, having transferred in from Miami. He was a bomb tech, very knowledgeable about explosives and the like. And he begins to tell me that he had been grabbed by the front office, which is highly unusual, as you know. The front office had got a call from FBI headquarters who had been called by the White House to advise that an Obama cabinet member may be the subject of a murder plot, along with a U.S. federal court judge in Boston a former Massachusetts attorney general, and possibly others. And Jerry, as you know, typically cases come in the door from a referral or a citizen or maybe another office. Very rare that a case is coming in from the White House across the street to FBI headquarters and then FBI headquarters down to the division. Absolutely. Around where things are funneling up. A lot of pressure to get this thing figured out and done. At this point, however, what I find out is that LeBlanc had already had some communication with the subject. Let me clarify that a little bit. LeBlanc gets word that there is a informant in a jail in Baltimore, Maryland, who had been arrested for unrelated charges and was talking to Secret Service and told Secret Service about this guy up in Malden, Mass, named Ed McLarnon, who was seeking to kill Dennis Saylor, who is a sitting federal U.S. judge in Boston. The former Massachusetts Attorney General, Martha Coakley, and Lisa Monaco, who at the time was the Undersecretary of Homeland Security in the Obama administration, now the current U.S. Deputy Attorney General for the United States. The informant says that he had worked with McLarnon, who went by Zed. That was his nickname. His first name was Ed. He was a 67-year-old sound engineer and had had enough of the way his life has gone and blamed the U.S. court system for everything that had happened to him. He had lost his home and his business, and his son had been taken from him in a custody dispute, and that he was looking to acquire serious types of weapons to conduct an attack on these people and kill them and potentially blow up the federal courthouse. When Brian begins to tell me this, I ask him, well, what's been done? What, what have we done so far? He tells me that they're initiating surveillance around the clock on everybody. Jerry, that's a big deal, right? Because you're talking the judge involves the U.S. Marshals. Secret Service now gets involved with a special authorization from the White House to protect Lisa Monaco. The Massachusetts State Police are involved, as it involves Martha Coakley. There's a lot of moving parts. Brian tells me that he instructs the source to tell McLarnon that he has an old friend in the Army who can get him these items that he's looking for. The informant had been a member of the U.S. Army. McLarnon had not been. That proved to be a little bit problematic for me because I had never spent a day in the Army. I was an active duty officer before I was an agent, but not in the Army. In an undercover work, you try to stay close to home. But we didn't have much of a choice. I talked to McGowan about it as well, and we came up with kind of a story of what we would say if McLarnon asked me Army questions. But nonetheless, we rolled with it. Had McLarnon ever been in the military? No, never. Okay. So luckily, if he had asked you any questions, he wouldn't have known whether your answer was right or wrong. Yeah, unless he had done his own homework or, mm. or, or had a family member. I, there was no indication he had any significant experience with the Army at all. But nonetheless, kind of rule 101 of undercover work is you only lie when you have to, and you try to control and keep your story kind of as close to home as possible. That's how I was trained. And I had the privilege of being trained by some of the very best, not only McGowan, but many others. And the story was always the same. It's easy to remember the fewest number of lies. 
So I would have picked a different backstory, but whatever. It, it, that's I was stuck with it. You've got a job to do and you do it. We've had a lot of murder for hires over the years or a lot of threats or a lot of allegations that get made. And so I say to Brian, you got to go go talk to the guy. Get on a plane and let me know what you think. Go evaluate the source and let's see if we can get the source on the phone to validate some of this stuff. Or if this is just someone who's venting about his plight in life rather than having a serious plan to conduct a terrorist attack. We have a lot of people who are angry and they vent and they say something and Informants sometimes want something out of it. So Brian flies to Baltimore. He meets with Secret Service. They grab the informant out of jail. They grab his cell phone out of evidence because it's the same phone number, obviously. He does an interview. They make a phone call to McLarnan. It's clear as day that this is really kind of what he wants to do. But he's very, very cautious about talking on the phone. McLarnan does not want to speak to the informant on the phone. He has no idea that the informant's in jail but does kind of go on a little bit about he wants to take action on the bad things that have happened in his life. So we devise a plan that we're, instead of having phone conversations, Brian is going to establish an email, essentially a Gmail address. We have the informant tell McLarnan that, look, we'll communicate through Gmail. Nothing will ever get sent over an actual server. I'll save something in the draft folder. I'll give you the password. You can log in. You can sign in in the draft folder and it'll never cross a wire. And we both can see it. And there you go. McLaren loves that idea, feeling as though he has remedied all his concerns about being detected via the internet or the big bad government that might be watching. Before you go further into his plot, you mentioned that he wanted to rectify some of the bad things that happened to him. Do we want to go into that a little bit more first? Sure. I can tell you what I knew from the case, and then I can tell you later what he told me in person. Just give us a little idea, and then we'll save what he told you in person. But right now, I think for me, I'd like to understand what's making him so angry that he wants to kill all of these people. Sure. The investigation revealed that McLarnan was a very active anti-government voice on the internet. He had a YouTube channel. He truly believed that the probate court system and the U.S. court system, anytime there was a ruling against for a custody issue, the ruling judge received a portion of the child support or alimony ruling. And it was a giant kind of racketeering enterprise where judges were being paid off for having children removed and or large child support rulings or alimony rulings. He lost his son in a child custody dispute with his ex-wife. Also, his business failed, and he blamed the government for that, although the investigation did not see anything that where his business had anything to do with the government. It just failed because, for whatever reason, he wasn't a savvy business person. His basement had flooded. He had water damages at home, and it destroyed a lot of the audiovisual equipment that he had. He fancied himself as a sound engineer. He claimed to have developed the very first 16-track audio system where Aerosmith recorded their very first album and other music groups had recorded several albums as well. He claimed that he was a, quote, special prosecutor and a forensic expert and had been hired by MIT and other government court agencies, essentially, to come in and serve as an expert witness to talk about tapes being doctored or evidence being doctored. None of that was proven to be true, obviously. That's how he held himself out. Now, one thing that was true, or at least appeared to be true, was that, and we didn't know anything about this social worker, which we'll talk about later, but his ex-wife married the social worker that was assigned to their case to provide an expert opinion on the child custody issue in Massachusetts probate court. McLaren and I discussed a lot of these things for hours in person, but that's what the general gist was. He felt that the the U.S. government, state government, and court system had stolen his child, ruined his life intentionally, and judges were lining their pockets as a result. And this was happening to people all over the country. It was a racketeering enterprise, and he wanted to stop. Okay. So at that point, Jerry, what happens next is the next morning after that phone call, we get a draft folder email that says wish list. And the wish list has a slew of items on it of all the weapons McLaren wants to begin his terrorist attack. He asks for a silenced pistol, a 22 handgun. He uses the words the type the mafia uses. He asks for an AK-47. He asks for sniper rifles with scope. 
He asks for grenades, dynamite with detonating caps. He asks for C4 explosive, a long list of items that are clearly not self-defense type weapons and offensive kind of weapons. We have the informant in the jail place another recorded call and McLaren asks him, did you get my list? And of course the informant says, yes, I did. It's no problem for this guy. And the decision is made. We're going to insert an undercover at this point, obviously. So we have the informant say, here's a phone number. If you're serious, text the words, happy birthday to this phone number. Don't call it. Don't talk about anything. Don't text anything else. Just text the word happy birthday. That means you're serious. That means you want to happen. And eventually you'll get contacted. So in mid to late October, I want to say October 18th or so, maybe 17th. I don't remember exactly the day in 2015. We get a text message to the drop phone that says happy birthday. That's all it says. So October 20th, I call McLaren and back. That's the first time we're ever going to speak. I ask him, you're the gentleman that wished me the happy birthday and sent me the birthday greetings. He tells me he is. Tell him that I have some items that I received from my birthday that you might be interested in. Love to show them to you. You're interested. He says, absolutely. He asks me where I'm from and where do I live? I tell him, I'm not going to tell him that. I'm trying to build rapport and be cautious on the phone. He's definitely cautious on the phone as well. And we agree that we're going to meet later in the week at a licensed firearm store up in New Hampshire, which is a place I had worked undercover for many years on other cases. So as that's going on, Tech Squad, I mean, this isn't just done in a vacuum. There's a million agents and good task force officers doing a lot of things here and analysts as well. The surveillance around the clock for everybody involved, all the phone analysis is being done. There's all types of analytic work being done. We're trying to find out, is he working alone? Is he working in a group? Are there others we need to be worried about? The case agent decides that Tech Squad is going to put a camera up on the, across the street to have better coverage. During a recorded call, we find out that McLarnan makes surveillance and he sees the tech squad putting the camera up and he's speaking to the informant about, I think I'm being watched. I think the government might be on to us, which presented some worry for us because every conversation he's having is talking about how much he hates the government and wants to kill government officials. This escalates a little bit, as you can imagine. And backing up a bit, Jerry, also in the terrorism side of the house, there's always a big push in the Bureau to mitigate the threat, right? Go knock on the door and find out, mitigate the threat. That happens a lot because we certainly don't want something awful to happen. So we're balancing the push to go disrupt the threat by interviewing him with, is there a case we can build and collect evidence to really mitigate this threat in a criminal prosecution? As I told you before, at this point, I've been in 17 years. I know there's teams of marshals working around the clock to protect the judge. I know there's teams of Secret Service agents working around the clock to protect the undersecretary. And so I know what that's like. I know you know what that's like. There's a lot of pressure here from the top. Get this thing done. Can you make a case? There's a lot of bodies and resources being burned on this. And who knows if he's going to go do it himself. Cowan was feeling it too. There's a lot of pressure from the mountain, right, saying, get it done. And I understand. I mean, these are bosses. They're good people, but they're not undercovers, most of them. And they have to answer to FBI headquarters as well, which I know in this case is also getting pressure from the White House and other agencies. People are feeling it at this point, and it's kind of boiling down to McGowan and I to say, get after it. So the poll camera issue aside, whatever, right? We'll, we'll figure it out. But the decision also gets made, which is not always the case, but sometimes the case, and I, I don't want to give too much tradecraft here, but a decision gets made that a SWAT team is going to be on standby covering this meeting, even though it's an initial meeting, because of the poll cam issue, because of the anti-government piece. I also know there's a large resource burn being made here with our full SWAT team listening to an undercover meet for us, which is an initial meet, which is not unusual, but not always the case. And um, they're doing that for your safety, I take it. Correct. Yeah. For our safety. Plus, we don't know if he's going to show up with someone else. We don't know who else is going to be in the parking lot. So there's surveillance, there's air surveillance, ground surveillance, and a SWAT team for this first meeting up in New Hampshire. I have no idea what to expect. I'm nervous, like any undercover meeting. It reminds me a lot of playing college football. You're nervous at first. You're nervous until the first play, and then you kind of settle in. I was nervous going into them like I am at you know the dozens of other undercover things I had done in the past. It's just human nature. If you're not nervous, you're either doing it wrong or something's wrong with you, I guess. That's my opinion, but I was a little bit nervous with him. 
McLaren comes in. He does exactly as instructed. He asks for the owner, which is what we told him to do on the email. Comes in the back room. We sit down. And this guy just begins, unlike anything I had seen before. He starts telling me for hours what's wrong with our court system, what's wrong with the president on down, all the way through the probate courts in Massachusetts and every court in between. And he begins to talk about that it is a racketeering enterprise, that it's all about money. Judges get a cut of every child custody case they work. He starts talking to me about a group that he had been a part of, that he was a some kind of designated special prosecutor within this pseudo-governmental organization that did not recognize the authority of the United States, and they were their own kind of country. And I'm listening to this, trying to kind of nod my head, but it's clear he's off. I mean, something's not right with this guy, clearly. Off in the sense of having mental issues or just a fanatic, just somebody who truly believes in something, and we've heard a lot about them, and something that the rest of us would think, no, that doesn't make any sense. I had no real concern. I mean, I, I did not find him to have any mental health or cognitive impairment issues at all. I found him to be very, very well spoken. He has just had some ideas that were far-fetched, that judges were lying in their pockets. That was far-fetched to me about they make money off every child custody case, this kind of pseudo-governmental lifestyle he was leading, not recognizing authority. I didn't think he was mentally ill. I thought he was just fanatical with ideas that just were illogical, but he believed them for sure. And my objective in that first meeting was just like every other undercover meet. I was just there to establish rapport and see what was going to happen. But I knew I had to push the timeline a little bit. It wasn't the kind of case that I knew could go on for six months or a year because of the constant scrutiny here. So I'm sitting with him for quite a long time, listening to these his allegations, his stories, his view on life, his view on the world. He does tell me about Aerosmith. He tells me about he's a sound engineer. He tells me about all the things that have happened to him in his life. And they're all bad and they're all the fault of courts around the country, but specifically Massachusetts. I have to ask you a question about the Aerosmith stuff because people are going to want to know. Was there any truth to any of that? Jerry, I never asked. I'm sorry. I don't know the answer to that. The case agent might know. I didn't care, to be honest with you. <laughs> I can understand. I, don't know, Jerry. I could care less. I had a job to do and it had nothing to do with Steve Tyler. Okay. I get it. I understand. While we're there, he starts to talk to me about his son being taken from him, essentially kidnapped is what he, he keeps using the word kidnapped. And he begins to explain to me that he loses custody of his son in a child custody case and that the state of Massachusetts psychologist who rendered an opinion in the case, which he believed led to his son being taken from him, ultimately ended up marrying his ex-wife. I have been told, although I haven't proven that that is true, that the, someone did marry his ex-wife. I have no idea about the affiliation with the court case. But at this point in time, Jerry, that name had never come up. And so like any other undercover case, there's always something that happens that you didn't plan for. I had been told Martha Coakley, the former Mass Attorney General, Dennis Saylor, a sitting federal judge, and Lisa Monaco, the undersecretary in the Obama cabinet, never have I been said a word about a state psychologist. And he begins to tell me that he's been in the office already. He's surveilled it already. He's taken business cards off the desk. He's broken in after hours. He knows where he lives, begins to tell me about that he's got a plan of how he's going to do it. He's going to wear a mask covering his face as if he has an infectious disease, which in 2015 sounded kind of odd to me. Now in 2022, many of us have been wearing masks for quite some time. That's what he was talking about, wearing a mask like that, surgical mask over his face. He talked about wanting to put a closed sign in his private office windows where he worked. And he was going to go in and shoot him in close range. He told me he had a 38 revolver, but it made too much sound. And he didn't like the idea of having his fingerprints being placed on the shells when he put the rounds in the cylinder. He wanted an automatic that was going to eject the rounds and then he could load them and not have his fingerprints on them and all this crazy stuff. He also told me that he was going to put his cell phone on and have his friend drive his car up to Maine or have someone drive his car up to Maine who would be unwitting and leave the phone in Maine, and then come back in a different car to commit the murder so that he had an alibi in place of where his phone would be if the government ever looked, because you can't trust the FBI and 
kept telling me how much he hated the FBI and how they were a bunch of jackasses and they would never catch him and all these things. <laughs> um, and that is really ironic. funny. Yeah. The thing that gets me is he's contacting you for a murder for hire, but he's talking about doing this particular one himself. Could you tell me so more about he, that? Yeah, Jerry. So he was never. So I, we try. We thought about trying to get him to hire us to do the murders only because then I could control the pace, right? If, if I'm being hired to kill somebody for him, then I don't have to worry as much about him going and doing it himself. So we tried to do that, but absolutely not. He wanted to kill this man. And then he begins to tell me all about the others as well. And he details each of them for me how he's going to do it. So there was never a murder for hire plot here. It was he wanted to get weapons purchased from me so that he could go conduct these murders. So uh, yeah, that's a little bit of bad info there. It was never a murder for hire plot. He wanted to be the killer. He told me he had been to Martha Coakley's house. He talked about he you know been outside of her home. He wanted to use an AK to he used the word spray and he demonstrated how he would use the gun to kill her as she was either coming out of the house or returning to the home and just blowing her to pieces. He asked me for grenades. I showed him fragmentary military style grenades. I also showed him less than lethal grenades, asked him which one he would prefer. He was crystal clear that he wanted nothing to do with anything that was only going to hurt anybody. He wanted to kill people. And he said he wanted to drop the grenades in Judge Saylor's car as he was entering the federal courthouse in Boston, which also houses the First Circuit Court of Appeals. And he explained to me how he thought he would be getting kind of two birds with one stone by killing Judge Saylor, as well as hopefully causing damage to the federal building and killing other judges as well. And then he began to proceed to tell me all about other judges he wanted to target. He didn't name any at that point. He just kept using the word courts. There are courts. And he kept saying, they're all doing it. And I want to kill as many judges as I can, preferably Massachusetts probate court judges. But at this point, he never has talked to me at all about Lisa Monaco. And I'm trying to get that out of him. I'm trying to ask him, what's your beef with this other person? We never got there. There was never a discussion. He never brought it up again. He kind of shrugged it off when I asked him the first time. And we never once had a conversation beyond that first day about anything involving Lisa Monaco at all. It was the others at length. So of the three folks I thought I was going in there to discuss, I ended up for sure getting this social worker, psychologist, and many other probate court judges in Massachusetts. Now it's even more precarious because you don't know who his victims are. He's all over the place with this. All I know is he has a laundry list of people, primarily judges, but others as well, that he holds responsible for his plight in life, and he's going to kill as many of them as he can before he goes out. He does say he's going to kill as many as he can. And I don't know who they are. I'm trying to get names out of him. And he just keeps saying courts, courts. They're all doing it. I'm going to kill them all. And of course, there's no way with that little information for you to protect any of those people. It really got out of hand. Of course, now things are ratcheting up quickly, right? In my mind, I'm saying, how am I going to get my arms around this? Can I get him to hire me so I can control the timeline? He is adamant, not only about hiring anybody, he gets into detail about how he wants to kill these people and the joy he will take in conducting the murders himself. And he continually tells me repeatedly that it's patriotic duty. It's his duty as an American. It's his duty to fight back against the system. This is ideology based, Jerry, as you know, this is what domestic terrorism is. This isn't, this isn't a guy angry or pissed off that someone married his ex-wife and he's going to commit a domestic violence type murder. Certainly he wanted to do that too, but this is taking on a large part of the system for ideology reasons. You mentioned him being anti-government and being affiliated with groups who did not believe they needed to follow the rules and laws of the United States. Was he part of sovereign citizen groups? Forgive me, Jerry, I don't have the background as the case. I wasn't the case agent, right? I was the undercover. And you know, I'm a tool. I'm one of many different tools that get used in an investigation. Having worked a lot of domestic terrorism cases, he definitely exhibited all the types of signs that a sovereign citizen demonstrates. It's my understanding there was never any proven nexus to known domestic terrorism soft sit groups, but certainly he affiliated with types that did not recognize the government's authority. As we're sitting in the room, 
he asks if he can start looking at firearms. And I'm in a licensed firearms dealer's store. So that's very natural. In fact, the setting is appropriate. There's guns everywhere under the glass on the walls. He picks out a bunch of different guns he wants to manipulate and move around and try. And he begins to tell me how he has shot an AK-47 in the past. He has a rifle. He has a 38 revolver. He talks about how he's a great shot and he's very proficient and has gone to the range and he's been preparing for quite some time. But then he throws me a little bit of a curveball and he says, hey, um, can we go outside and shoot? Let me back up a little bit. I show him some rounds for a 38 revolver that were powderless rounds. And powderless rounds, if you don't know, they're quiet. They don't make a lot of sound. And they're real and you can buy them. They're legal to own and possess, but they're powderless. When you pull the trigger and it strikes the firing pin, it's very quiet compared to another round going off. He loves it. He goes ballistic about the idea about anything he can do to quiet his presence when killing this psychologist is great because he loves his gun. He loves his 38. So he asks me, and he doesn't have any guns with him when he arrives, but he starts talking to me about that. He asks me if we can go out and shoot. I don't really have any heartburn with it, but I'm not crazy about it because A, I know he hates the government. B, I know that the whole camera has been identified. See, I know the case agent is not going to be happy about it. And I know the SWAT teams are all going to be watching saying, Jesus Christ, Mike, come on, you're putting us in a spot here. But at the time, I felt like it just was going to help with the rapport and get more from the story. And in fact, looking back a little bit, Jerry, a lot of the things that I just discussed with you before came after we shot because he was more comfortable with me. So forgive me for getting the timeline a tiny bit wrong there. So we went outside and we shot a bunch of rounds, powerless rounds and regular rounds and AR-15s and M-16s and AKs and shotguns and a bunch of stuff. While we're shooting, he turns and looks at me and he whispers to me, this would be a great place to kill an FBI agent. And at that Whoa. point, I lose my mind a little bit, but I understand I have a job to do and it's time to be professional. I know that it's everything inside of me not to not to have my body language scream anything other than, yeah, it would be. So I turned back to him and say something like, this would be a great place to kill them all. And he starts laughing and we walk back inside. And after making sure that my underwear wasn't soiled, we uh, continued with the discussion. Now, we had to stop for a minute and just let that sit, because when he says that, do you think that he's totally bought into who you are? Or is there a thought in your mind oh my God, he knows who I am and I'm about to have to fight for my life. Obviously, yes, it crossed my mind. But at that point, we had had such open dialogue about what he wanted to do and his, I mean, we were there for hours. I thought it was part of his comfortability with me, but I wasn't positive. The gentleman that owned the firearms store was outside with us at the time. And I had worked with him a lot. He had never once done anything wrong. He wasn't a felon working off a of jam. He was a good citizen who was just trying to help. I know for a fact that he saw it. I have a firearm in my hand at that point, but I know he did as well. And so I was confident that if something was going to happen then and there, that was when it was going to happen. He whispered it so quietly as well that my, my body wire didn't even pick it up when I went back and listened to it. You could hear a mumbling, but you can't really make it out. So I was confident also that I was wired with audio and video. Obviously, the SWAT team and the cover team wasn't going to pick that up because it was really like right in my left or right ear. But you thought that the owner of the gun shop heard it. I don't know for sure if he heard it, heard it, all of it, but he knew something was different. He knew I was alarmed because I'd worked with him so much over the years to the point where he kind of took a step closer and I could just tell he was ready to respond if needed. But to answer your question, yes, it crossed my mind for sure, but I really thought it was okay. And at this point, and very soon thereafter, I said, all right, yeah, we're great. Let's go back inside and finalize this thing. Why is he so upset with FBI agents? Had he had any contact before this case started with the FBI? He had contacted the FBI office many times, many, many times to file complaints of judicial corruption and that we was disappointed that the Bureau had not followed up on his continual complaints and that we must be part of the problem, must be part of the conspiracies and the corruption that he had been a victim of. He had called FBI Boston many, many times to complain about the corruption of judges and wanted the FBI to investigate. 
So we come back inside, we start to negotiate prices. We go through all the stuff and I tell them what I can get. I tell them, we got to be serious here. I don't want to be driving around with the stuff, all these things. We come to an agreement. It's like 700 bucks for some grenades, some AKs, all these other things that he asked for. No plastic explosive, no dynamite. I tell him I can't get that stuff only because I just didn't want to deal with it. Take down time having dynamite or C4 laying around, just dangerous stuff. The grenades, will I can explain that later. So we come to an agreement. He's going to buy two grenades, a silenced handgun, an AK-47, a bunch of rounds. What struck me as interesting in the room, I probably gave him, I want to say, five, six times I asked him over and over again, like, you don't have to do this. There's other ways to do this. And he repeatedly kept telling me he had had enough and it was time and he was going to fight back. He called us, essentially, me and to his friend, the informant, a gift from God, that he had finally found somebody that was going to be able to get him the equipment that he needed to finally carry out his lot in life, his terrorist attack or attacks. I tell him, give me some time. I'll reach back out to him and, and we will meet up again and that'll be great. And he says, wonderful. Yeah, no problem. So he takes off. Surveillance takes him home and all's right with the world. They're continuing to monitor him and So now the case is spinning as well, because all these people are still constantly under surveillance and all the things that go with that, as you know. But what ends up happening is, and I knew it was going to be a problem the second that he said it to me, was he's told me now he owns two firearms, a 38 revolver and a rifle. And so the concern is he's going to start killing people on his own. He ain't going to need me. So the case team says, you got to find a way to get his guns from him. Now that I'm out of the bureau, Jerry, I can tell you that that doesn't make a lot of sense. Why Why does a weapons dealer, black arms weapons dealer, need to buy someone else's guns? I'm the guy selling guns. Why would I need his guns? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any um, sense, but were you able to do it? Well, we had no choice, right, Jerry? You've got to roll with it, right? The objective is get the firearms out of his hands. Okay, so McLaren was not very well off financially, as you can might imagine. His house flooded out. He lost his business. He's paying a lot of money to a lot of different places. And he was kind of destitute. I was able to swing a deal with him where if he let me, if he let me buy the rifle and the 38 off of him, I could probably move that for a small profit. It would help reduce his price for the stuff that he wanted. And he liked that idea. Because he didn't want the 38 anyway, only because it made too much sound and he didn't like the idea of his fingerprints on the rounds. I can't remember the exact terms of the deal, but we cut a deal where it was 700 bucks plus his rifle, plus his revolver, and I'd give him the items he wanted. And so we agreed to do that. I tell him, all right, I have all the things you want. This is early November of 2015. I say, look, I got the things you want. Why don't you come on up, bring those guns with you, but do me a favor, don't bring those guns into the office. The owner doesn't like people having concealed firearms in the store, which is also stupid. It's a gun store. Everyone on the planet who walks into a gun store in New Hampshire has got a gun on them or they're about to buy one and leave with one on them. So that story also didn't make a lot of sense, but I did not want him walking into that store with two guns on his person if I could avoid it. So surveillance follows him all day. They follow him to a storage shed and he's in there and they see him like digging and digging through stuff. And he's like frustrated, but he ultimately leaves and closes the storage shed by his house. He comes out empty handed. McLaren drives up to the firearm store. It's now, like I said, early November. He comes in. It's an unseasonably warm day at this point which poses some problems for me because of the way I was concealing my recorder in the past. Because in New Hampshire in November, it's usually not the warmest place on the planet. That day, it was super hot. He shows up in a t-shirt in shorts. So we rolled with it. We figured out how to do that too. So he comes up and he tells me immediately, I couldn't get the rifle. I went to my storage shed. It was locked. I couldn't get at it. The rifle was behind a bunch of stuff. So I know that story is true because surveillance saw him. So I know he's starting with telling me the truth, which is a good thing. I say to him, well, how about the 38? And he says, I got it right here. And he pulls it out of his pocket. He's sitting about a foot and a half away from me. He's got his finger on the trigger and it's pointed, let's just say in my general kind of upper thigh groin region. I think I saw that surveillance video as part of the FBI declassified TV show. That's in the show. Okay. Yeah, I could see. And you reach right out to him and push his hand away. A hundred percent. I mean, (laughs) Jerry, between you and I, the two things that are going through my mind are obviously I don't want to get hurt. 
But also, if you're going to shoot me, please don't shoot me there. I mean, shoot me, in the, shoot me somewhere else, but not there, please. <laughs> yeah, it was it so, was point, um, it was pointing a little low. It was at my groin for sure. I do reach out and say, hey, man, like basically, hey, and I'm trying to play it off. So I grab it and it happens to be unloaded. But I don't know that at the time. Right. I'm looking at the wrong end of a revolver and his fingers on a trigger and the, and the action's closed. And that's unpleasant. Obviously, I calm down a little bit and I tell him, hey, let me go show this to the owner. I want to make sure that he's it's safe. Plus, I know you want those powderless rounds and let me let him fit the gun for you perfectly the way a gunsmith would do it. It's all bullshit. It's all nonsense at that point. I'm pissed that he brought the gun in because a, he's not following instructions. Now I'm back into undercover mode right away. And all I'm thinking is I hope to God that my audio is working back to the surveillance team because I know for sure that, as you know, we have coded words, right? We have a lot of codes and coded words to say, I'm okay. Leave me alone. Don't come get me. Or I'm not okay. Come get me now. And at that point, I'm giving all the code words, hey, I'm fine. Don't come get me. I'm good. Don't worry about it. But as you know, things fail. Audio fails. Video fails. So my concern at this point is, do they hear me? They might see me, but do they hear me? And has a senior supervisor made a decision to tell the SWAT team, go get them, go extract them and handle your business. That's my concern at that point in time. Because I don't know, I'm assuming my audio works, but I don't know for sure. Immediately after that, we start talking about grenades. And McLarnan asks me, how long does it take when I pull the pin? Now, I'm still thinking about that gun that's been pointed at my groin. And I'm still thinking about that SWAT team that could be coming. And I make a huge mistake. And I say, you got 30 seconds. Now, he's asking me about how long does he have before the grenade detonates? I know, having done this a lot, it's three seconds. In my mind, I'm saying to myself, the SWAT team's going to be here in less than 30 seconds. And when they do, they're going to take care of business. That's what's going to happen. So I make a mistake because all I'm thinking about is being shot in the groin or the SWAT team coming or both. And I make a mistake and say, you got 30 seconds. He does not like that at all. And he immediately says something to the effect of 30 seconds, the damn judge will throw it back at me. It's just actually pretty funny. But I make a huge mistake. The TV show talks about it. They don't give the explanation about why. I absolutely own the mistake. But what's going through my mind at that point in time is you got 30 seconds because I know a bunch of FBI agents are coming through every door and window here in a second if they didn't hear me say I'm okay. So luckily they don't come. They must have heard me say I'm fine. We fix the 30 second problem and I tell him, hey, I made a mistake. It's three seconds. Don't worry about it. And he won't leave it alone though. He keeps asking me about 30 seconds versus three seconds because it's going to mess up his plot. So fair enough. I tell him I will confirm with my army personnel and all this stuff, but I'm positive it's three seconds and I just made a mistake. And eventually we get over it. We spend another several hours in that room that day and he continues to go on to talk to about all the ways he's going to kill these people. And it's very graphic what he's going to do. He's going to shoot the psychologist in the head and all these things he's going to do to the judges and Coakley and all this stuff. I try again to revisit Lisa Monaco. He doesn't touch it. He will not touch it. He just kind of shrugs it off and says he's not going to talk to me about it. Continues to tell me about his alibi, making sure his phone is on, how he's going to defeat the FBI and GPS monitoring and all these things. He had planned it out pretty good. You've mentioned Mike McGowan a number of times and said that he was the undercover coordinator in the Boston division. I've actually interviewed him twice on this show, episode 136 and 143. And him talking to us about the undercover program, one of the things that he mentioned is that the case agent almost has like a want list and the prosecutors have a want list of what they want the undercover agent to get out of the subjects that they're encountering. What is it that they wanted you to get from McLarnan during these recordings? And have you been able, you've talked to him hours and hours now, have you been able to get those elements of the crime that they need to prove their case? First of all, Mike McGowan is the best undercover agent that I ever saw. He thought differently than anyone I ever met. He worked differently than anyone I ever met. I worked a lot 
a lot with him over the years. In many, many, many cases, in full-time cases that went on for years, he's the most talented undercover agent I ever saw and ever worked with. And I think the world of him. He's a dear friend of mine, but he was a mentor from day one. I've seen a lot of really good undercovers. None I saw do better than him because he thinks like a criminal in a good way for the FBI. He's right. There's always objectives. And like anything in the FBI we ever do, whether it's undercover work or other work, what are the objectives of this operation? The case agent will say, I really need you to get the following. And you try to find a way to get the following. In this case, it was, what's the deal with Lisa Monaco? That one never materialized. There was really no need for a second meeting until I got told I had to get the guns from him. The objective of the second meeting was to get the firearms out of his hand and then also to essentially set up the final takedown day and how that was going to go down. The objectives of the first meeting were build rapport and find out what he wants. No one expected him to go on a litany of this diatribe of why you want to kill all these people and in such graphic detail. But as you know, right, you get someone who wants to talk, I'm going to let him talk as long as he wants. It doesn't matter what words are coming out of my mouth. It matters the words that are coming out of his mouth for a jury. Those were the objectives for meets one and two. Meet three, which is later, is the takedown day. Again, I tell him in meet two, you don't have to do this. There's other ways to solve your problem. He tells me absolutely not. This is his mission. He tells me many times he needs to do close-up work. He can't wait to conduct these murders, blah, blah, blah. I say, all right, well, listen, I'm going to send you a text tomorrow or so, and it's going to say something about, let's get a cup of coffee. Do me a favor and just respond that, yeah, you'll meet me for coffee. And if that happens, that tells me that you're good to go and you still want to do this. But if you tell me you can't make it, then that just means you changed your mind. You don't want to do any of this stuff. Sure enough, in early November, I believe, I send him a text that says, uh, hey, you want to get coffee? And he immediately responds, absolutely, I'll see you tomorrow for coffee, which is at the same location that we had agreed in the room that day of where we would be and what time we would be to make the exchange of the final amount of money and the items that he had asked me for. One of the things that I'm thinking, which means many of the people listening are thinking, is if he's not hiring you to do these murders for him, why is it necessary for him to tell you what he's planning if all he needs from you are the weapons, are the firearms, are the grenades? Jerry, that's a great question. So I can tell you this. Right around the same time as this case, I was doing a very similar exact case that also went to trial, so I can talk about it. Same thing, same exact thing. I wanted grenades, told me that the real constitution of the United States was hidden in the mountains behind Mount Rushmore, and the fake one is the one that was posted in, the, in D.C. and blah, blah, blah. But the objective was to find out why he wanted grenades and what was for it. He would never tell me. He said, you don't need to know that. To your point, back to your question about objectives, there was obviously the objective of, hey, if you can find out why he wants these, great. I never even had to ask him. To this day, I have no idea why he wanted to tell me so much. Now, I do know that he talked to me a lot about divorce. I rolled with it. I talked to him about, I know a lot of people who've been divorced. I've been divorced. I know a lot of people in the area. It's terrible. Maybe you can help me out, help my friends out. I tried to build a common kind of rapport with him. And I think he thought that I was just someone who was going to be a believer and was going to explain to me all the things that were wrong with the system. I agree with you, Jerry. I found it to be extremely odd. <laughs> but hey, he wants to tell me. I'm going to give him every opportunity to tell me for as long as he wants. And I'm going to ask him repeatedly to explain it to me if he's going to be that open about it. It's not the first time that's happened to me, by the way, in cases. I've had other people walk in and tell me right away, this is what I want to do and this is why. Okay, have at it. It is not the norm, that's for sure. It happens. You don't know what's going to happen when people walk through the door. That's part of what's fun about working undercover. Absolutely. It's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a science and an art. So we agree to meet. Everything is fine. But as you know, Takedown Day is a production. It's a large number of bodies. SWAT team, aviation, ground surveillance, evidence response teams, who's going to drive the car, who's going to process the crime, all that stuff. There's a lot of moving parts to take down day. And you practice and you go through it. And as an undercover, you learn where to stand, where not to stand. You kind of move in a way that helps. He can't see certain things. You see things different way. You have to give signals in a way that people can see what you're doing. 
There's a lot of considerations for public safety that have to come into play on takedown day making sure that we're not putting anyone at risk in the public so that we can execute an arrest safely. Long story short is we meet at the rest stop in Seabrook, New Hampshire, which is right on the I-95 corridor. It's the first city in New Hampshire as you cross from Massachusetts as you're driving northbound on I-95. Again, it's now mid-November, so it's brisk in New England at that time. There's not a lot of people out and about. We park far away. I park basically under a tree far away and tell them it's because I don't want the cameras to pick me up and whatever else. But at this time, Jerry, now I've done a lot of listening to this guy for hours and hours and hours and hours. Honestly, I'm sick of him, to be honest with you. But he wants to start again to tell me about killing people and how he's going to do it. So I listen to him for a little while longer. But once I get to the trunk of my car, now it's my turn to talk because I know this is the last chance I'm going to see him ever again. I know it's my last opportunity to collect evidence. And at this point, it changes. I can tell he wants that bag and he wants to get out of there. He's giving me the money. He just wants to leave. And I'm not just giving him the bag and letting him walk away. I'm going to go through every single piece of equipment that I'm being sold, that I'm selling him. I'm going to show it on camera as best I can. I'm going to hope that he asks me more questions about it. But if not, I want the jury to see every single item he's getting and one another opportunity to say, yeah, I changed my mind. I don't want to do this. That doesn't happen. Even to the point where I do not take the bag out of the trunk, I say, there it is. It's yours. Knowing full well, there's another opportunity he can say, I changed my mind. Instead, he reaches in, puts the bag on his shoulder. I give the signal, the, the takedown signal. I start walking northbound. He starts walking southbound. And I can see the multiple SWAT Suburbans coming at me. And so I just keep walking and I know that they affect an arrest and aviation picks it up. It's on the TV show. If anyone cares to see it, the arrest gets made and he gets taken safely into custody. Where is this takedown site? It's at the Seabrook, New Hampshire rest stop in Seabrook, New Hampshire on I-95. They do a quick search warrant of his car. They find all kinds of written materials. He's writing songs or poems about how he's at its wit's end and he's had enough. He's been pushed too far and the time has come. They do search warrants at his house, the storage shed, and the car. They find the addresses for the judge, for the Attorney General Coakley, for the psychologist. They find phone numbers. They find family information for all those potential victims as well. He was ready. He had done his homework. They take him back to Seabrook, New Hampshire Police Department. Brian LeBlanc and another agent interview him there. You can see part of that on the Discovery Plus TV show, not the FBI Declassified show. They show a portion of that. He's kind of sinister and basically says, have you seen what they've been doing to me for years? But he claims that he just wanted a weapons, the weapons to defend himself. And they ask him, why do you need grenades and dynamite and C4 and an AK to have a silenced pistol to protect yourself? He finally lawyers up. That is in 2015. The case doesn't go to trial until 2018. So three years later, it takes to adjudicate this whole thing because there's countless appeals, numerous attorneys get turned over, and McLaren ultimately elects to represent himself at trial, which, as you know, is never Never, pleasant. never, never pleasant. The judge in the case is Judge Barbaduro, who is squared away, very accomplished judge and just a good man, a competent, brilliant, brilliant judge. But there's some leeway here. I want to back up. There were two judges in the case. One was Judge McAuliffe, who, as an aside, was, if you remember, Krista McAuliffe, the school teacher that actually passed away in the early 80s with NASA. NASA sent a teacher up in space Mm -hmm. and the Challenger exploded. She was the school teacher in that tragedy. So McLaren represents himself, but he gets tremendous leeway because he doesn't really understand the process. He's asking very unusual questions. What's the name of your children? Where do you live? Things that you just we would never answer. And his defense is that he was working undercover against us, that actually he knew we were the government. He was trying to route out the corruption and that he was making a book and a movie about working undercover against undercovers. That was his defense. Oh, what Uh, a great defense. (laughs) That's never been said before. It was an interesting dynamic. The trial lasted six days. I was on the stand for quite a long time and listened to him go back and forth. There were a lot of procedural objections because he didn't really know what he was doing. I did find that he was engaging and he had thought out his kind of defense about he knew I was an undercover the whole time and he was going to prove to the world how to go undercover against undercovers and he was going to have the greatest documentary in history. Didn't happen. 
He was found guilty on all counts for illegal possession of explosives with intent to commit murder, possession of illegal firearms, and possession of a silenced firearm. He was sentenced to 25 years. That's how the McLaren story sort of ended. He continues to file appeal after appeal, or he did. In April of 2021, the First Circuit Court of Appeals upheld his January 2018 conviction, and he remains in prison as of today. Excellent case review. I do have one last question. I can understand in his mind why he wants to go after the judge and the psychologist or psychiatrist. Was it a psychiatrist? I keep calling him a social worker. I don't know for sure, but McLaren referred to him as an abuse expert. I can understand why he wanted him because obviously he wrote up a report to the court that did not favor him. I don't even know if that's true. That's what he believes. Okay. All right. So that's what he believes. I can see that for that particular guy and for the judge. But for the life of me, what did the was it an assistant attorney general? No, it was the attorney general for the state of Massachusetts. He believed that like the FBI, he thought that she was responsible for not taking his complaints seriously with him trying to point out probate court corruption that probate courts were not operating the way they should, that the probate court judges were having financial gain every time they made a ruling that involved money and that they were lining their pockets. And he had made it very well known to Massachusetts Attorney General's office, including Martha Coakley herself, and she did nothing about it. And as a result, she needed to die. And what about this White House appointee? To this day, I do not know, nor has anyone else in the case known what his beef with Lisa Monaco was. I assume it's Department of Justice related, but I don't know. I never got it. He never told me. He never told anything about it in any kind of confession. He didn't make a very long statement when he was arrested. This is fascinating. I guess my mistake is trying to put some rationalized thought into (laughs) what his motivation was. So I should stop myself from trying to understand what his thought process is. But it's fascinating to try to figure all of this out. I've worked a lot of domestic terrorism undercover cases. And when you're sitting across a table from someone who seems very cogent and put together and being articulate, but what they're telling you is completely illogical. I've had this happen to me a lot in numerous undercover cases. And you want to say to the person across from you, do you have any idea like, like how far fetched what you're saying? I mean, it's ridiculous. But it's happened to me a lot, <laughs> more than the more than the public would ever want to know, because I can't talk about the cases that didn't go to trial. It's good to know that when those thought processes go really haywire and start to involve violence and murder plots, that there's law enforcement and the FBI and undercover agents that are going to go in there and stop the threat and thwart the threat. So good for you. Well, thank you, Joe. I'm very proud of the work we did. As McGowan and others have explained, and I know you know it because you did it yourself as a case agent, undercover work is one of many investigative tools used by experienced case agents to help solve crime and work investigations, national security or criminal. We have one job to do. It's obviously dangerous, but at the same time, it is an investigative tool of many options used by the FBI and law enforcement. On that thought, let's give another shout out to the case agent on this particular case. And if you know the names of the AUSA, the federal prosecutor, let's give some love to him or her, too. It's a privilege to work with the case agent, Brian LeBlanc, a very experienced case agent. The prosecutors in this case were John Davis, who was the lead prosecutor and a very experienced AUSA, fantastic guy to work with. And Matt Hunter, who was brand new to the office, who did a phenomenal, phenomenal job as well. It was a privilege to work with the United States Attorney's Office as well. In New Hampshire, the relationships are phenomenal. I loved working there and I loved working with them, but both John and Matt did a great job. All right. So now we're at the point where we get to learn a little bit more about you. And at the beginning of the episode, I did read your bio, a short version of your bio. So we know a little bit, but my standard question always is, when and why did you join the FBI? I joined the FBI in December of 1997. All I ever wanted to do or be was be an FBI agent my whole life. I was a military officer for a little bit. It was wonderful. I enjoyed every bit of that as well. 
I did not grow up in a law enforcement. Well, I shouldn't say that. I had wonderful parents who were school teachers, but my grandfather was a uniformed police officer in the city that I grew up in. And boy, he looked like a superhero to me in that uniform that he would wear. And I'd see him at, you know, three, four, five years old. He was a police officer for 37 years. But something struck me as a young kid that I wanted to be an FBI agent in the worst way. I spent my whole life trying to stay out of trouble to be an FBI agent. And almost immediately after becoming an agent, they want me to pretend to be a criminal as an undercover agent. That is kind of funny. You were an undercover agent, but of course, that is a collateral duty. What else did you work in the bureau? And when did you retire? And what are you doing now? Thanks for asking. I spent a lot of time on an organized crime squad in Boston, which for folks listening, the Boston Organized Crime Squad's got some interesting history to it. I then also worked international terrorism cases, domestic terrorism cases in Boston, ultimately ended up transferring up to the New Hampshire Resident Agency Office. We work everything there because it's a small office. Ultimately was blessed and had the opportunity to become the supervisor for all the New Hampshire offices, which was really a great experience as well to learn. And then at the very, very end, got asked to come down to Boston for the last six, eight months to be the acting ASAC, Assistant Special Agent in Charge for the Counterterrorism Branch, but continued to work undercover the entire time. It was just a great blessing to work with McGowan and his team. I worked undercover all over the world and loved every second of it. I missed the FBI horribly. Still, even though I've been retired, I retired in September of 2021, and it still feels like someone cut my right arm off. I miss it horribly. I don't miss the nonsense, the administrative nonsense. I miss the people. I miss the work. I miss the mission. I miss the sense of purpose. I miss the camaraderie and the accountability to get after it. I miss all those things horribly. It was a great ride. It was time to leave. I took a job in the private sector, working in emergency management for a large utility. We forward one step at a time. The last thing that I like to do is to give my guests the last word. So what would you like to say? I'd like to just thank every single person, both within the FBI and outside the FBI, who helped me live that dream. Like I said, being an FBI agent is all I ever wanted to do and be. A lot of really good people took time. Jerry, you were one of them, took time and were patient with me to help a young kid of average ability, of average intellect, be involved in some things that were far from average. And I'm just so grateful. It was an amazing ride. I said on the CBS show, I would have done this job for food money. And I really would have. It is the greatest job I ever could have imagined. It never really felt like work. I just want to thank every single person along the way who helped me live that dream. And that's the end of the interview. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to the show notes at jerrywilliams.com where you'll find a photo of Mike Ghibli and a longer bio, a surveillance photo of the subject, Edward McLarnon, and lots of links to news articles and videos about this case. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode, or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, Once a month, via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist, where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.